Hi, welcome back to this chapter uh, 11. And chapter 11, we are going to continue to talk about the fixed asset and the PPNE uh, and intangible assets. And then instead of uh, focusing on the acquisition, what we will do is trying to figure out uh, how do we utilize the assets and how do we dispose the assets. Um, so we address the allocation of cost of this asset to the period benefited by their use, right? So, so we're using a computer we are using for many years, and during those time, is actually those asset is the providing value for those periods, and then hence we wanted to allocate the costs of those assets into the different period, right? And same thing as intangible asset, we also wanted to amortize an intangible asset such as patent, copyright has a limited life, and also franchise or trademarks have a limited life. And then for the for the for the intangible asset that it has no limited life, then we will talk about the amortization or impairment uh, uh, analysis, right? And then also we wanted to talk about uh, natural uh, resource depletion. How when we when the natural resource is uh, offering the production, offering the value, and uh, how do we amortize? How do we depleting those uh, uh, natural resources? Uh, and then also we consider uh, issues such as uh, final disposal like or as an uh, impairment of those assets and treatment as expenditure subsequent to the acquisition. In a nutshell, we want to learn what happened after you acquire the assets. Okay. So first of all, I wanted to uh, establish a very good understanding of why we are talking about the cost allocation in the PP&E or the long-term asset section. So first of all, PP&E, which is a property, plant, and equipment, and intangible asset are purchased with an expectation that they will provide in future benefits to the company, usually for many, many years. That's why they categorize as long-term asset. And this asset are acquired to be used as a part of revenue generating purpose, am I right? Because they are part of the operation, their sacrification or their usage is trying to generate in products and services that's in exchanging cash in the future. Hence that we consider the cost such as depreciation cost, amortization cost as a part of allocation to, to, to matching those revenues. Hence. In other, word, in other word, the acquisition cost of this asset should be allocated, which is the purchase price should be allocate, uh, allocated to the periods that benefit by their usage, right? Okay, uh, so on, after we understanding this, then the cost allocation are uh, known as, first of all, if it's a PP and E, then we will talk about depreciation. Uh, we are called the depreciation cost. If it's natural resources, we call it depletion, right? And then those words are a little bit different, but it means totally different thing. And then if it's intangible asset, we say we, it's called uh, amortization cost. Okay, so how do we measure uh, the cost allocation? Uh, so this is uh, uh, in conceptually, uh, the process of cost allocation requires the three factors to be established at the time of asset putting in use, right? The three factors are service life, allocation base, and allocation method. The service life stands for the estimated use that the company expected to receive from this asset. In other words, how many years do you believe this asset is valuable, still usable? And the second allocation base is meant the cost of the assets expected to be consumed during the service life, such as it's going to be purchase price minus residual for the equipment. The allocation method is uh, the pattern that in which the allocation base is expected to be consumed. It can be uh, based on years, it can be based on usage, it can be based on production uh, volume, right? So different, uh, uh, different way to allocating it. Okay. First of all, service life. We wanted to talk about each component. Service life is amount of use that 
company expected to obtain from asset before its disposal. In other words, it's usually expressed in time or activities, right? For example, the estimated service life of a delivery truck could express in terms of years, or it can be in terms of miles, right? The company expected the truck to be driven for uh, before the disposal, uh, disposition. For a, depreci for a depreciable base, uh, physical life uh, provides the upper bound of service life, right? And uh, uh, physical life will uh, vary according to the purpose for which the asset is acquired and the environment in which it's operated. In other words, the service life, uh, the, the physical life can be changed. For example, a diesel powered electronic uh, generator may last for many years if it is used only as emergency backup or for only a few years if you use it regularly, right? So in other words, uh, you have to see what is the purpose that equipment or the property is and then how is the environment uh, that the property is operating under to deciding the service life. It's not some uh, uh, like a, a fixed amount of years or activities that is not circumstantial. Okay, and then there's a something I want to stress here is that the service life of a tangible asset may be less than the physical life, uh, than the physical life of a variety of reason. For example, uh, the reason uh, for the tangible asset, right? The for example is the expected rate of technology changing is faster. For computer, you say that the computer's physical life can be say 100 years because it's a piece of plastic and some semiconductor metals. It does not disappear, you know, all of a sudden. However, the service life for a computer these days probably less than five years, right? Because the expected rate of the technology changes are very fast. Hence that a lot of times it's not useful even it's right there, right? And second thing is the supplies are expected to, the second possibility the service life is smaller than physical life is because the supplies, suppliers are expected to develop new technology that are more efficient, right? That means that uh, the company may keep an asset for a period of time much shorter than the physical life because the supplier of that uh, asset are, are ready to develop a new technology to replace the old one that you have. And then third reason is that likewise the company sells its product in a market that frequently demand new products, right? Such, such as what we just talked about, the computer, the, the, the frequency of the consumer demanding new toys are faster than ever. Hence that the old machines are out of date very fastly. Hence the service life will be reduced, reduced as, as well. And, uh, and then the last thing, uh, the fourth thing is that service life is economically not feasible, similar as a physical life, right? Um, for example, um, a, a minery deposit might project it to contain 4 million tons of mineral, but it can be economically feasible with existing extraction method to only about 2 million tons, right? So even though uh, you know there's a more mineral in the, in, the, in the mine, but you are not able to actually extracting it because the you might have a technology or safety concern. And then the last thing is that sometimes the management also doesn't want to have a service life as long as a physical life. Uh, for example, intangible assets maybe uh, have a legal or contractual life often is a very limited factor and the patent may be capable of providing an enhanced profitability for 50 years, but there has a legal life only for 20 years, right? So. Uh, in other words, the legal and the contractual life will provide upper bond for the services rather than the physical life of the assets. Okay, so what is the special thing about uh, uh, allocation base? The allocation base is a amount of cost to be allocated over the asset service life. And uh, usually it will be the initial value of asset at its acquisition minus the salvage value right at the disposal. And salvage value, the definition is that amount expected to be received at, for the asset at the end of its service life 
less any anticipated disposal costs, right? And then so therefore, in some circumstances, the residual value can be estimated by referring to a company's prior experience or public available information concerning the res resale of the various uh, type of assets, right? And then sometimes residual value are uh, immaterial or assumed to be zero. And uh, when you're estimating residual value for many assets, it can be very difficult due to uncertainty about the future. But you can see the history, how much similar asset is uh, categorized as the residual value. But sometimes it's actually can consider as a zero. Okay. The third thing that we want to talk about is allocation base. Allocation base is a method that should be selected uh, that corresponds with the pattern of the benefits received from asset use, right? And then uh, using this allocation base uh, method, we are trying to determine how much cost to allocating for the period over asset service life. And according to the US GAAP, the chosen method should be allocating the, the asset cost as uh, equitably as possible to the period during which service are obtained from its use. In other words, GAP uh, specified that the method should produce a cost allocation in a systematic manner, okay, rational manner, and then the objective is trying to allocate the cost to the period in an amount that is uh, proportional to the amount of benefits generated by the asset during period relative to the total benefit providing the asset during its own life. And then in nutshell, we actually come up with two kind of uh, general category of allocation method. One is time-based allocation method, another one is called activity-based uh, method. Time-based method is basically is allocating the depreciable base according to the passage of time. It's like the older it is, the, the, the more depreciated it is. And then another thought is uh, allocating the depreciable base using a measure of asset input or output. Okay, so as a, a financial accounting, we kind of talk about the depreciation method already. So hence, I'm not gonna uh, spend too much time talk about a straight line, okay? And then too much time talk about the accelerated uh, method. Only thing that I wanted to talk about is that straight line and accelerated method are both considered as a time-based depreciation method. And also, under accelerated depreciation method, you have a couple different choices. First of all, uh, accelerated depreciation means the declining pattern of depreciation with a higher depreciation in the early years and smaller than in the later years, right? So it has a double declining and sum of the year digits method. And I will introduce the sum of digit year method here, but a double declining uh, is a, basically you use a, two multiple straight line, right? So as that dividing the uh, years, number of years, Right, so hence that in the early years, your, do, your decline doubled than the straight line method, right? Yeah, and the sum of years, I will show an example in nutshell, and then in, in short period. And then the second way of depreciation is activity-based depreciation method. We usually use a unit of production method, which is the compute a depreci depreciation rate per measure of activity and then multiplies these rates by the actual activity to determine period periodic depreciation. Okay, sum of year depreciation. At the beginning of the year one, Hongen Manufacturing Company purchased a machine of $250,000 and made the following estimate at that time. Estimated residual value is $40,000, estimated service life is five years. The machine was disposed after five years of use. SYD depreciation, which is the sum of the year depreciation method for each year is listed as following. So basically, we wanna use a numerator. If it's the first year, the numerator will, will be five and the denominator will be n multiple n plus one dividing two. So if it's a 
total five years of life, there will be five multiple five plus one, which is six, dividing two. Then five multiple six dividing two is going to be 15. So the denominator here is 15 years. So one, then this rate will be the first year depreciation rate, which is a generating depreciation expense of $70,000. Accumulated depreciation will grow to from zero to 70, and book value is gonna be 180,000. And then after that, you still use a, depreciate, a depreciable base, multiple the second year depreciation rate. The numerator gonna be four year because you already used uh, one year and you're left with four years and divided 15. Uh, and then the depreciation expense for that year will be $56,000, and accumulated depreciation is gonna increase to 126,000, and the book value of the year will be reduced another $56,000 to 124,000. So, so on so forth, you will find out at the last year, you depreciate everything depreciable which is a $210,000, you're left with a $40,000, which is the residual value, right? Then you set up at the beginning. Okay. And then let's look at the unit of production method. In the beginning of year one, Hongen Manufacturing Company purchased a, a machine for $250,000 and uh, made the following estimation. Estimated residual value for $40,000 and estimated service life for five years and estimated production in total is $140,000. So the depreciation rate per unit will be using the original price minus the residual value dividing the production units. Hence that we know that for one unit production unit, we should depreciate that machine for $1.5. And then hence that to calculating uh, the depreciation expenses, we just need to know how many units was produced by each year, multiple the depreciation rate per unit, and we can figure out depreciation expenses. Okay, decision maker's perspective is much more interesting because it's a higher level thinking. So straight line method towards the decision maker is much simple, right? Uh, why does so many companies using straight line method as opposed to other time-based method? And the many companies per perhaps consider that the benefits derived from majority depreciable asset is, uh, is to be realized at approximately evenly over the years of useful life. Hence, the certainly contributing factor is that straight line is very easy. And, uh, straight line method resulting less depreciation in the early years of an asset life compared to accelerated method, right? Hence that in the early years, the using straight line method is have a positive effect on net income because otherwise if you using accelerated method, the early years will have a lot of expenses. But uh, however, the straight line method will give a negative effect uh, on the net income in the later years because the later years on the on the accelerated depreciation method the, the expense is going to be much lower however the straight line is going to be much higher and uh, uh, on the other hand straight line uh, on the other hand the accelerated method resulting in more depreciation in the early years right and then the consideration by the management the decision perspective it has its own benefit because when you have a high accelerated uh, de depreciation expenses, that means that you can derive tax benefits from a greater depreciation deduction because your net income is low, hence you pay less tax, okay? So unlike life of conformity rule, which means that the financial accounting and reporting purpose and tax purpose should always co converge. If you use LIFO in financial reporting, you use LIFO in the tax report. And it, but here it does not like that. Unlike LIFO conformity rule for inventory evaluation, no constraints in using a different depreciation method for financial reporting or tax reporting purpose. So in other words, you can use double declining in the tax purpose and then you can use a straight line for the financial reporting purpose. And third thing is that 
uh, activity-based depreciation uh, typically providing a better matching for the revenue and expenses. That's exactly true because the machine is to providing the construction uh, services for producing new inventory. And then hence that the new inventory will generating the revenue. The more inventory you generated, the more revenue you will have. Hence, the more depreciation you should have, right? So the activity-based activity based depreciation is the best way to matching the revenue and expenses. And the additional issue related to cost allocation is the partial period allocation. And then such as the, the, when the acquisition and disposal uh, occurs at a time other than beginning or ending of the physical year, and then we need to be careful to understanding how to partially uh, creating the depreciation expenses for the acquisition year. And the depreciation, depletion, and amortization is recorded as a part of the year that asset is actually used. And then such as the half year convention. The convention where one half of the full year's depreciation is recorded in a year of acquisition and another half is the year of disposal. Okay, so let's look at this example. April 1st, 2021, Hongen Manufacturing Company purchased a machine for $250,000, made the following estimation, right? Estimated residual value was $40,000. Estimated service life is for five years. Estimated the production units 140. And the company has a December 31st year and the actual production during the five year asset life is following. So unit product in the beginning is the 16,000 and in the end is 8,000 total to 150. However, when you're trying to depreciate it, the first year you wanted to make sure that you multiple three over four because it was not starting on January 1st, it was purchased on April 1st, right? So that means that you only enjoy the um, uh, April 1st to December 4th, you only enjoy 8 months out of 12. Hence, if you use the uh, straight line depreciation, you cannot think that $42,000, right? You have to only consider the portion of it from April uh, year 1 to uh, December year 1, right? And then for the double declining method, you also need a multiple 3 over 4 because it still started with April to December 31st, hence it's only 3 fourths. And the unit production method, you don't need to do that because it doesn't matter when you started, as long as you're producing that many of the products, you can start with day 1 or day 10 or day 20, doesn't matter, you are chasing after the production uh, units instead of the timing. And the partial year depreciation only applies to timing method of the allocation. Okay. Okay. So let's look at the disposal. So first of all, um, when the company actually, um, when the property a PP and E comp. Uh, is almost near the end of the life or a company uh, wanted to retire the, the asset even earlier than that. So when companies retire or selling the PP&E for monetary consideration, which is uh, either con considered uh, debiting cash or uh, accounts receivable, and then in this case, it's the seller will recognize gain or losses, right? For the difference between the consideration was received and the asset book value. In other words, that this is the cash that you will receive to sell the second-hand uh, equipment that you use. And then, uh, but the original cost needed to minus the depreciation expenses to getting the book value of the equipment to figure out how much gain or how much losses we incurred on the asset. So for example, uh, a gain on the sale of depreciable asset means that the asset was sold more than its book value. The net increase in the book value of the total asset is an accounting gain, not economic gain. Okay? A loss signifies that cash received is less than the book value of the asset being sold, 
and there is no net decreasing in the book value of total asset. Okay, so there is another kind of asset we're talking about is a uh, asset that held for sale. Sometimes management plans to sell the PPNE or an intangible asset, but that sale hasn't happened yet. Hence, we call those kind of assets called asset held for sale. In this case, the asset is classified uh, in the period in which following criteria are met. So when the company's management committed to plan to sell the asset, or the asset is available for immediate sale in the present condition, or an active plan to locate a buyer and sell the asset has been initiated, or the completed sale of the asset is probable and typically expected to occur within one year. Or the asset is being offered uh, for sale at a reasonable price relative to current uh, fair price. The management's action indicating a plan is unlikely to change significantly or to be withdrawn. So another way, uh, way what I wanted to say is uh, an asset classified as a held for sale is reported at a lower cost, current book value, and fair value of any cost. They don't depreciate. Asset held for sale does not depreciate, but they need to value whether the cost itself is bigger than the fair value or not. If it's lower, then we need to uh, write it down. Yeah, so I want to say it's no longer depreciable. If you decide for sale, you no longer can depreciate it or amortize it. And then we have to uh, classify it as a, a held for sale uh, equipment is a re reported at a lower of the current book value uh, or its fair value. So the, instead of uh, selling uh, used uh, assets, sometimes uh, the company want to retire the asset early. So at the time of the uh, retirement, um, the asset accounts and the corresponding accumulated depreciation are removed from the book. And a loss equals to the remaining book value of the asset is recorded. And then sometimes uh, instead of chasing each company, uh, company wanted to conveniently to recording the depreciation by grouping uh, uh, or composite a group of assets together and we call that a group and composite depreciation method and the group and the composite depreciation method depreciates the asset collectively rather than individually to reduce the recorded uh, record keeping costs and uh, what's the difference between group and the composite the group depreciation method is a collection of uh, depreciable assets that uh, look like each other or similar like each other, have a similar lives or other attributes. However, the composite depreciation method is a collection of depreciable assets that are physically very dissimilar but are aggregated anyway to gain a convenience of a collection uh, of a collective depreciation calculation. Let's look at an example, okay? The Express Deliver Company begins its operation in uh, 2021 and it uh, will depreciate the fleet of delivery uh, using the group method. The cost of a vehicle purchased early in 2021 along with residual value estimated life and street line depreciation per year by type of vehicle as follows. So first of all, all these assets are vehicles and uh, they have a similar life, six years, five years, four, four years. Hence that the company decided to group them together. How do they do that? They're adding their co uh, total costs and then they're adding their residual revenue, uh, residual value, and then they figure out the depreciable base is 272. And uh, mm, 
So when they uh, depreciating the uh, the straight line, so each year they were depreciating twenty thousand for Benz truck, for twenty thousand dollar and twelve thousand dollar for wagon, and it totaled up as a fifty two thousand eight hundred. So fifty two thousand eight hundred dividing a depreciable base of three hundred thirty is about a sixteen percent a a year of depreciation. Has said if that's the logic, then we use a depreciable base of 272 dividing each year's depreciation expense. We kind of figure out either by percentage by year, we figure out 5.15 years are used by all this group of uh, uh, machine, right? And then, uh, and then another question is that what if you wanted to change the constitution of the asset group such as you wanted to add in a new asset or other asset are retired so addition additions are recorded by increasing the group asset account uh, for the cost of the addition that however the depreciation is determined by multiplying the group rate which is either the 16 percent or the 5.15 years right by the total cost of asset in a group for that period and another thing is that after the group or composite rate has been determined or average service life has been determined, they normally are not changing, okay? Despite if you have any addition or disposition in the group assets. And also no gain or loss is recorded when the group or composite asset are retired or sold. For example, any actual gain or loss is included in the accumulated depreciation. And then uh, like uh, continuously talk about the delivery truck that in the, uh, con the group asset or the cost of $15,000 and sold for $3,000 in the year 2024. And then the journal entry will be get rid of the credit, the vehicle for $15,000 and debiting the accumulated depreciation. And then you did not, you don't want to recognize any gain or losses, right? And then you debit the, the directly the cash you receive. In other words, if you grouping the composite depreciation, uh, if you're using this method, you don't want to recognize gain or losses when there's a reduction, there's a disposition, okay? Okay, and then we want to look at how we're depleting the natural resources. Uh, once we own a piece of timber or a mine and we needed to explore it and also once we explore it we started in production it right we are exhausting the natural resources that is out there hence that we need to also allocate in the cost of natural resources that you excavate ex excavation ex excavated from the production revenue that you sell those uh, natural resources and we use activity-based unit of production method to uh, calculating those periodic depletion, right? Because the usefulness of the natural resources is directly related to the amount of resources that is extracted. And the service life is the estimated amount of natural resource to be extracted. So for example, the depletion base is gonna be the cost minus the residual value. And depletion per unit will be the depletion base dividing the estimated extractable units. And then hence that when we record depletion expenses, we want debit depletion and accrediting natural resources. And then if we're using any equipment in the extraction, there is a certain treatment. If the asset is movable and usable on the future asset uh, projects, then the asset depreciable base should be allocated over its useful life. If the asset is not movable, in other ways, the asset should be depreciated over its useful life or the life of natural uh, resources, whichever is the shorter. In other words, that if you if the asset is uh, usable in the future, then we don't care about how many production was served for this specific ex extraction, we just depreciate as a normal equipment. However, if the asset is not able to move, once you purchase it's attached to that uh, uh, mine or that uh, piece of land, and then use the useful life versus uh, its natural uh, resources uh, useful life, you want to use which one is shorter. 
And then the third thing is uh, usually we use unit production method to calculate a depletion uh, cost. Uh, and then how do we do that? Uh, and we will also do that when we depreciate in the asset used in the extraction as well. So same thing, you wanted to use the numerator as a depleting uh, depletion base and then uh, uh, divided by the estimated extractable units. Okay. And then after we talk about the tangible asset, now we wanted to look at how do we allocate the intangible asset to the periodic uh, revenues, right? To matching the costs, allocating the costs. And then we call the intangible asset amortization, right? So first of all, intangible asset has its own useful life, right? Some of them are uh, finite life, some of them are infinite life. And uh, uh, those life usually are legal, regulatory, contractual provision of unlimited useful life of intangible asset. And useful life might sometimes be less than the asset legal uh, contractual life. And the second thing is that does intangible asset has any residual value? And then first of all, it's ex the expected residual value of intangible asset should be always zero. The residual value is if it's not zero at the end of the asset use for life to the reporting entity will be benefited to another entities. And the allocation method here is we wanted to, the method of uh, amortization also reflects the pattern of using the asset in generating the benefits. So let's look at an example. Hughes, uh, he, uh, Hollings Corporation began to co operation in 2021. Early in January, a company purchased the following two intangible assets, a franchise from Ajax Industries for 200000 a franchise agreement is for 10 years period, a patent for $50,000, the remaining legal life patent is 13 years. However, due to expected technology obsolescence, the company estimates that the useful life for the patent is only 8 years. Holdings use a straight line amortization method for all intangible assets. The company's physical year end is December 31st. So to uh, amortize the franchise, we wanted to use 200,000 dividing 10 years of useful life. And to amortize the patent instead of the 13 years of legal life, we want to use the company's regard uh, consideration of useful life, which is eight years, right? Okay. And then Another thing is a software development cost. Remember, we talk about this cost is the software capitalized uh, between the techno technology feasibility, uh, between after technology uh, feasibility and before uh, commercial production or uh, or product release date, right? And we we capitalize this portion of the cost. We call it the software development cost. And then, and of course, this software development cost is also an intangible asset. We need to amortize it, right? And the amortization of capitalized software development cost begins when the product is available for general resources, general release to the customer. Hence, that you need you start to cap, you start to uh, expense it the day that you release your products. Okay. And then the periodic amortization percentage is uh, the greater one, one of both. Either you can use a straight line to calculating a number A, or you can use a percentage of revenue method to calculating number B. If a B is bigger than A, you, you will record at B. Okay, let's look at an example. The Astro company uh, develops uh, computer software graphic programming for sale. The new development project started in 2020 and reached the point of technology feasibility in June 30, 2021. The cost in 2021 are uh, uh, as follows. Prior to technology feasibility is 1.2 million. From June 30 to December 31st was uh, $800,000. The software was available for sale on January 1st, 2022. And it has the following uh, related sales information. Sales in 2021 is a 3 million. Estimated sales from the future two years is going to be 7 million. The total estimated sales for four years is 10 million. 
In 2021, the Astro company would expense a $1.2 million cost in the R&D because uh, it's prior to establish of technology feasibility. But it will capitalize the $800,000 in the cost because it's occurred between the technology feasibility and the product availability date. And then to amortize this of $800,000, we can do this way. First of all, we can use the percentage of revenue method, which is to see uh, $3 million was generating as a revenue for 2022, and in the future, there is a $7 million of generation potential revenue generation. That means that um, the current revenue divided into current uh, uh, and the anticipated revenue is called a percentage of a revenue a method is a 30% of the total revenue can be generated by the product. And if we multiply the $800,000, which is the, uh, the uh, software development cost, that we capitalized in the year 2021, right before the product release, we, we find that $240,000 should be uh, amortized. But on the other hand, if we straight line it using straight line to amortize it, we have a four years of future sales expectation. Then one out of four is 25% multiple 800, generating $200,000 of amortization expenses. Comparing 240 with 200, 240 is bigger. Hence that we will record $240,000 of amortization expenses. And then if we are looking at intangible assets that are not subject to the amortization, such as uh, 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 tangible asset that has indefinite useful life, what do we do? First of all, useful life is considered indefinite if there is no foreseeable limit on the period of time over which the asset is expected to contribute to cash flow of the entity. right? And uh, indefinite does not necessarily mean permanent, right? And the intangible asset with indefinite useful life are subject to a, a test called impairment test. We will talk about in learning object eight of this chapter. And then the things we talked about uh, before, what kind of uh, intangible asset will have an indefinite life? There will be goodwill, one kind of trademark, and the trade names. Okay. And then we w I wanted to talk uh, quickly about once we figure out how to allocating the cost from uh, PP&E, intangible asset, natural resources to the uh, revenue periodic cost. And now I wanted to say if you have changed your mind in terms of your estimation, what you will do. So first of all, the changing of the uh, allocation base or any life, service life or residual value is only going to continue prospectively, means going forward. Okay, We don't treat it as a accounting error needed to change in backwards for many, many years. And then it's reflecting the financial statement of current and future period, not historical period. However, you need to accompany a disclosure note that describe the effect of the changing, such as the effect on the net income <coughs> and related shared amounts. And then let's look at a quick example. On January 1st, 2019, uh, a home game manufacturing company purchased a machine for $250,000. At the time of a purchase, the company estimated the following. The service life of the machine is five years. Residual value is $40,000. From on January 1st, the company revised is estimated as follows. One, service life is uh, from five years to eight years, and the residual value decreased from $40,000 to $22,000. And the company's physical year end is December 31st, and the street line depreciation is adopted for all depreciation expenses. Uh, and depreciation for 2021 sub and subsequent year as recorded as follows. So in the financial accounting, we said any time that you change your mind in regarding the estimation of the fixed asset depreciation, we treated the, the, the year of changing mind as a new asset. In other words, 
For two years, from 2019 to 2021, this company considered the residual value is uh, $40,000, and then the life service life is gonna be about five years. So therefore, the first two years, 2019 and 2020, you were depreciating the asset as the following. You will use 210, which is uh, 250 minus the residual value, dividing five years. And then two years later, you should depreciate $84,000. And then hence that the, the, the book value, okay, as of January 1st, 2021, the book value, should it be $250,000 minus the total depreciation of $85,000, which is 166. Since you're changing the estimate on that day, hence that we needed to treating it as new asset with a new residual value of 22,000. Hence that the revised depreciable base is become 144,000. Since there, the new base is become RV is 22,000 and the, 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 uh, the service life is eight years. And then since the eight years, we have already used the two years of life, hence the leftover should only be six years. So the newly or annual depreciation should be 24,000 by debiting depreciation expenses, credit accumulated depreciation. And also I want to say changing in depreciation, amortization, and depletion is uh, changing is considered as a changing in accounting principle. Although it's a changing in estimates, but it's, uh, it's achieved by the purpose, uh, the changing by accounting principle, right? Accounting for the same way as any other changing in accounting estimates. And then it's require a very clear justification as to why the new method is preferable. And because this changing in estimate is a result of a changing accounting principle. In another word, if you changing from straight line, your service life changing from 10 years to eight years, it's essential is accounting principle change, but it look like accounting estimate change. We said if it's accounting estimate change, we're only going forward, but essentially it's a counting principle change. And now also in terms of recording uh, uh, PP&E, you will make some mistakes sometimes. If you uh, search the errors involving PP&E will be for, for example, computational errors when cap calculation depreciation, uh, depletion and amortization or mistakes that you made in determining whether the expenditure should be capitalized or not. So the treatment of such material errors occurs in previous year should be uh, uh, treated retrospectively. So if it's an error made, you have to restate what it should be from the year that you made a mistake. And also all the account balances has to be corrected. Okay. If a returned earning requires a correction because uh, uh, the depreciation expenses will affect net income and then affecting current year's earning, beginning earnings, you also needed to correcting the earnings at, as a prior year's adjustment, right? At the beginning, beginning return earning adjustment. And uh, also no disclosure needed to tell the readers the nature of the error and the impact and the correction on an income. For example, in 2021, the controller of a Hathaway Corporation discovered an error recording $300,000 legal fees to successfully defend a patent infringement suit. Okay, and then the $300,000 was charged to a legal fee expense. Okay, we know if you are successfully defending an intangible asset, especially patent, you should cap capitalize it, right? Not expensive. So, but unfortunately, it was an error made years in 2019. And then they charge everything to the legal expenses, right? Debit legal expenses. And then uh, uh, this mistake should be capitalized and amortized over five years of resuming life of the patent. The straight line amortization is used by Hathaway for all other intangible assets. 
So the correction should be, first of all, in 2019, you should debit pattern 3307. And then in 2019, you should almost, at the same year, you should amortize it for $60,000 because it has five years of life. And then in 2020, you should also uh, uh, expense uh, for $60,000. Hence that uh, for 2021, all you need to adjust is to record the pattern leftover pattern, which is a $300,000 minus the two years of amortization, which is going to be $180,000. And then the returned earning impact will be two years of over expense, uh, uh, over expensing, right? So basically you have to reduce the uh, expenses because you expensing $300,000 uh, as uh, right now, but you essentially should only expensing $120,000. And that's why the $180,000 should be not booked on under R RME, should be increasing RME. Hence, that you credit RME for $180,000. Okay, so uh, the next uh, uh, video, I'm going to talk about the how to figure out impairment of an asset. Okay, see you next video.